Asian economy, which drives the world. Um, and it's going to have a lot of implications, right? Facebook's worst month ever uh, continues. We talked last week about Facebook having a le internal leak called the Facebook Papers. Uh, this is a, a continuous leak to not only the Wall Street Journal, but apparently members of Congress are also getting it. And the leaker and the SEC and the SEC and the leaker apparently works in the safety uh, group. Uh, according to a congressperson who has been getting it, and they are going to uncloak themselves, and that they were leaking this out of frustration that there is human trafficking, democracy issues, and obviously self harm in girls using Instagram and uh, you know this research. But that's not all. Facebook uh, is admitting uh, for the first time this week that Apple's privacy updates are hurting their ad business and. I think the story you're referring to is that two groups of Facebook shareholders are claiming that the company paid billions of extra dollars to the FTC to spare Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg from depositions and personal liability in the Cambridge Analytica saga. From the political Politico article, quote, Zuckerberg, Sandberg and other Facebook directors agreed to authorize a multi billion dollar settlement with the FTC as an express quid pro quo to protect Zuckerberg from being named in the FTC's complaint made subject to personal liability or even required to sit for a deposition. According to the article, the initial penalty was 106 million. But the company agreed to pay 50 times more 5 billion to have Zuck and Sandberg spared from depositions and liability. Uh, here is the money quote, the board has never provided uh, this is from the group of shareholders suing the board has never provided a serious check on Zuckerberg's unfettered authority. Instead, it has enabled him defended him and paid him paid billions of dollars from Facebook's corporate coffers to make his problems go away, Chamath. I have one um, prediction. The Facebook whistleblower, uh, you know, when you are a federal whistleblower, number one is you get legal protection, but number two, which people don't talk about much, is you actually get a large share of the fines that are paid by the act of your whistleblowing. You know, there was a couple of SEC claims that I think were settled last year where the whistleblower got paid, I think, like 115 odd million dollars or something, and just an enormous amount of money. And the SEC has done a fabulous job in, you know, using whistleblowers as a mechanism of getting after folks. And, you know, I think the SEC said they've collected almost a billion dollars since this whistleblower program started that they've paid out or something, just an, an enormous amount. And I had this interesting observation, which is this person leaked a bunch of stuff or whistleblew to the Senate, to Congress, to the SEC. There probably will be an enormous fine. This person may actually make <laughs> billions of dollars, which will then make every other employee at Facebook really angry about why they didn't leak it first. Because all I guess all this stuff was sitting around, and apparently now they've shut it down, right? So that, that entire data repository around this whole topic is no longer freely available for employees to peruse. So, oh, what under a key TAM thing? Well, I, I think it was more like, like, I guess, like, all of this data was sitting inside of some Facebook in s internal server. Right? No, no, I mean, I mean, this, this leaker makes money under like key TAM. So the like SEC will pay uh, for information that results in um, a fine. And so they just recently announced um, that they uh, paid out a $114 million whistleblower payment. That was the highest uh, ever. Um, and that they, this whistleblower's extraordinary actions of, uh, and high quality uh, information prove crucial to successful enforcement actions. I don't think they announce all of these whistleblower payouts. Um, they just pay them. So they're so not that's, all so that's, that's my one observation is I, I actually think this whistleblower may make billions of dollars. So more than any of us made at Facebook, which I think is hilarious. But the second thing, which is more important, is that there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about how sentiment amongst Americans have now really meaningfully changed. And I, Jason, I don't know if you have those stats, but this is a plurality of Democrats and Republicans where it's like 80% of anybody now basically says the government needs to check big tech. Uh, the Wall Street Journal published an article uh, yesterday highlighting a new poll conducted for the future of tech commission. It found that 80% of registered voters, 83% Dems, 78% Repubs agreed that the federal government quote, needs to do everything it can to curb influence of big tech companies that have grown too powerful and now use our data to reach far into our lives. Findings are based on a survey of 2,000 or so registered voters. I think it's a really, um, really, really tough road that these guys will have to navigate these next few years. Can I, can I offer some contrary views here? Yeah, please. 
So, um, you know, the whistleblower thing, you know, real whistleblowers, in, in my view, are like Snowden or Assange, who are, you know, basically overseas and um, or, or in prison for, for telling what the US government is doing. And the difference is, I'd say, they're whistleblowing, if accepted and acted upon, would reduce the power of the US government. Whereas these, you know, kind of awards and so on, I think they they do distort incentives. It's not like they're giving a billion dollars to Snowden for blowing the whistle on the NSA. The military industrial complex is not happy with that. But this money is being given because the government is currently mad at Facebook and wants to do something that is like a quasi-nationalization of Facebook. Now, very similar to what happened in, in China, where basically all the tech CEOs, they, they just do it much more explicitly there. They just basically decapitate all of them, say, okay, you're going, you know, spending time with your family. In the US, it's done in this sort of denied way and so on. But the, the US government gaining more control over Facebook is not a solution to Facebook's real problems. It's just going to mean backdoor surveillance of everything. Every single thing that was pushed back on every end to end encryption thing that they implemented. Now, the Keystone cops in the US government, not they don't just surveil everything, then their database gets leaked, and it's all on the internet, just like what happened under the, uh, the solar winds hack. So I'm not denying that there are, you know, like bad things about Facebook, I actually think on net, it's probably being uh, more beneficial than, than many people say. But I don't believe that the federal government is a solution to those problems. I think the solution looks more like decentralized social networking, where people have control over their own data, not simply the US government quasi nationalizing the thing. So, you know, people bring up this decentralized social network thing, and as if it is a better solution, I think you believe it's a better solution. But I, I rarely hear anybody talk about well, if there's slander on a decentralized network, if there's child pornography, if your personal banking information or your, you know, you were personally hacked, and that information was put on a decentralized social network, that cannot be reversed and stopped because it's decentralized, correct? It depends. Um, you know, the thing is, it's basically about Wait, the why does it depend? You just said that the blockchain couldn't be changed and that all the facts were permanent. So why does it depend now? Well, for something like child porn, for example, it's actually being used for that you're not going to find lots of people who are running those nodes. It, it, it is it's something where edge cases are always used to attack something. Uh, there's a famous cartoon which says, how do you want this wrapped? And it's called control of the internet. And it's either protect children or stop terrorists, right? And so when you, when you talk about an edge case like that, I mean, the, the CSAM stuff, child porn, you know, th that was that's used by Apple to justify intrusive devices that are scanning everybody's stuff. The I think the answer to a lot of those things is if if you're doing something that's bad, there's usually ways of going after it that don't involve this gigantic surveillance state that was, after all, only built in the last 10 or 20 years, just normal police work that you can do. Um, if they're actually like, you know, a bad guy, there's other forms of police work, you can get search warrants. You don't have this completely lawless thing where you just, you know, some guy in San Francisco hits a button and you're digitally executed. And so, so, you know, it's not that there isn't any possibility for rule of law. It's just that it has to actually be exercised in this, this I think form. We're, listen, I think we're a long way away from decentralized social networking actually being the norm or being a solution, Jason. I think we're at the step of actually figuring out and uh, how much tolerance we have for probably specifically Facebook and Google's specific business models. And it's those business models that I think are coming up against privacy, they theoretically now and we'll figure this out may be coming up against mental health and you know, our child welfare policies and what we all view about that. And those are fundamentally governmental issues that they should adjudicate. And I think the more important thing that I take away from all of this is that we've all kind of let it probably get a little bit too far. And I think now that there's a plurality, um, something's going to happen, I don't think it's going to be right. I don't think it's going to be just it's kind of like trying to perform surgery with the rusty knife. There's going to be all kinds of collateral you're, you're damage speaking specifically to how to police Facebook, Twitter, social networks. I think it's just like social media. I think we've jumped the shark at this point. And so and, and I think folks would you see want decentralization as the solution? Like biology? I, I, I do think that that's the ultimate solution for two key things. One is the most important thing that we all want is to know what the actual economic relationship we're having with folks that we spend time with is. So 
when we spend time with friends, that's friendship. There's no economic relationship there necessarily, okay? When we spend time with a lot of these applications, there is a subtle economic relationship that is actually hidden from us, which is that we believe we're getting value for free, but really what's happening is we're giving back a bunch of information that we don't know. When you move to a world of decentralization, you shine a light on how people make money and you allow us to vote. Do I want it? Do I not? That single feature will provide more clarity for people than any of this other stuff will because it'll force people to then step into an economic relationship with these organizations. And I think that that's just fair because those folks should be allowed to make money, but we should also be allowed to know what the consequences are and then decide. David, you are a big proponent of freedom of speech. Uh, we saw massive uh, election interference, the Russians trying to use social media to create division, uh, other countries doing it to each other. It's not just the US and Russia, it's China and Russia and everybody doing it to each other. Do you believe that something like election interference and those bots would be solved or it would get worse because of decentralization? Are you a fan of decentralization or would you rather have a centralized Facebook, Twitter and somebody responsible like Zuckerberg or Jack? To, to mitigate this for democracies around the world? Well, the, the, the problem that we have is we do have a problem of social networks spreading lies and misinformation. Um, however, the people who are in charge of, um, of censoring those social networks keep getting it wrong. So they allow disinformation to be spread by official channels, whether it's, you know, um, you know, whether it's, uh, a uh, corporate journalist. Are you going to say doctor? Are you going to say Dr. Fauci? <laughs> no, <laughs> there, there, there's so many official channels that yeah. get things wrong. Yeah. Um, we talked last week about the uh, Rolling Stone ivermectin hoax. There's been absolutely no censorship of that manifestly wrong story. There's no labeling of it. But then a subjective opinion, like what Dave Portnoy posted about AOC attending the Met Gala, which can't be factually wrong because it's just him an opinion that gets fact checked and labeled. It's bizarre. So the situation we have today is we're not preventing misinformation. We're just enforcing the cultural and political biases of the people who have the power. And that is always a problem with censorship. And this is why I agree with Justice Brandeis when he said the, the you know, the su sunlight's the best disinfectant. The, the answer to bad speech is more speech. We need to have more free and open marketplaces of ideas. And that ultimately is how you prevent um, disinformation. So decentralized Twitter, decentralized social networks, do you think that is too much sunlight and too unruly, the fact that things could be spread on there and well, not stopped? Well, I'd, I'd like to see what those things look like when we actually have them. It's, I agree with Tramath that we're still some ways off from that. Are we? I mean... But uh, yeah, but Can I say a few things yeah. on that? Yeah, go ahead. Because I think we have these out there. Isn't Mastodon out there and other services out there and they are contending with these very issues? So By the way, it's this, happening. This, this philosophy was not sorry. Sorry, Balaji. I, I just say one thing before you go. But like this, um, this general philosophy is is not novel. Uh, you know, the internet and and the, the the what are being called the tech platforms were meant to be the response uh, to the undue influence that kind of Americans thought existed already in the media when they emerged in the late nineties. Um, and you know, you can go back hundreds of years. Like the state was meant to be the response to the church. And, um, you know, the media was meant to be the response to the state and propaganda. And then the tech companies were meant to be the response to media. And, you know, now we're talking about decentralization be kind of being the response to tech. And at some point, you know, information accrues in this kind of asymmetric way. And it, be call it becomes called that undue influencer. And that I think ends up becoming the, the recurring battle that we'll continue to see whether or not this notion of decentralized systems actually is the endpoint or is just the next stepping stone in the evolution um, that is this constant kind of evolving cat and mouse game of where does the information lie, who has control over it, and who's influencing people um, ends up kind of being, I think, the big narrative that we'll kind of realize over the next couple of decades. But I, I don't know, Balaji, if it becomes the endpoint, right? I mean, it, it, this, is, this feels to me part of a longer form narrative. Yeah, so I think like lots of things look cyclic if you look at them on uh, like this. If you look from the Z axis, it's more like a helix where you do make progress, even if it seems you're going in, in, a, in a loop. And so I think, you know, it, it's centralized, then you decentralize and you recentralize. It's like the concept of unbundling and bundling. You unbundle the, the CD into individual MP3s, you rebundle into playlists, right? And so with decentralized media, it's not 
purely every single node on their own, I think it's more like a million hubs and a billion spokes. And Jason, to your point, basically, most of those hubs are not going to allow things that 99.99% of people think are bad, like CSAM, you know. As for the other things like, you know, slander, hack documents you mentioned, the thing is current central arbiters will falsely accuse people of these things or enforce them in political ways. It's it, the centralization is actually also not a solution It's being abused, as, as Sachs, you know, points out. And in fact, official disinformation early in COVID, which, you know, I had to like, basically beat back with a stick, fortunately, you know, got some of it out in time. But, you know, people said the flu is more serious, the travel bans were overreactions, that only Wuhan visitors were at risk, that avoiding handshakes is paranoid, that the virus is contained, tests are available, masks don't help. You know, all that stuff, the Surgeon General himself, you know, tweeted out, you know, people don't wear masks, right? BuzzFeed, you know, NYT, all these guys got the story wrong, and then they rewrote history to pretend that they didn't. So that to me is a much greater danger when you have a single source of truth that's false. Right. So we're picking the least bad solution. It's such a good point because I'm old enough to remember when Balaji was right <laughs> about, <laughs> about, about everything related to the beginning of COVID. And I'm old enough to remember when in April of last year, I wrote a piece in favor of masks when the WHO and the Surgeon General and all these official channels were saying, don't wear masks. So the problem is with with this these with official censorship is that they keep getting it wrong. They keep getting it wrong. And I want to hold on. I want I want to bring one one more one more quick point. Okay, Jason, you mentioned foreign interference on Facebook. I would really encourage anybody who's concerned about that issue to look up. You can go look. You just Google the actual ads that were run by agents of the FSB on Facebook during the 2016 election. You can actually see the ads they ran. I want to make two points about that. Number one, the ads are ridiculous. They are, they are sort of like an absurd, uh, you know, foreigner's perspective. They're on meme. They're meme with bad English. Yes. Bad English. And it's, it's somebody who doesn't understand American culture's attempt to propagandize an American. And you look at it, it's so ham handed. Let me give you an example. It's like, in one of them, they've got Jesus arm wrestling with the devil, saying, and it's Jesus saying that I support Trump, and the devil saying I support Hillary Clinton. I mean, literally stuff like that. Okay, it's utterly like stuff you'd see at a Trump rally. It's utterly absurd, and nobody would ever be convinced <laughs> by it. The second, except thing for the is, people at Trump rallies. The, the second, <laughs> the, the second thing about it is that when you actually look at the number of impressions that were created by the sum total of all of the so the so-called disinformation of all these ads it is a fractionally small infinitesimal drop in the ocean compared to the total number of impressions on Facebook and so i'm not disputing the fact that somebody in the basement somewhere in moscow perhaps was running oh, some it was proven was it was like hundreds sort of, of people hundreds, was running yeah. some sort of disinformation operation that was running ads on facebook what, what i am saying is that when you actually look at the effect and quantitatively and qualitatively, you realize that that whole story was massively blown out of proportion in order to create an hysteria that then justifies censorship, then justifies the empowerment by centralized authorities well, by to way, be able to Russians regulate to be able to regulate these social networks with the effect that the people in power end up censoring in ways that do not support the truth but actually just reinforce their own power. That is what the disinformation story is really about. No, it's not. What it's really about, Sachs, is that Russia wants to pit people like you and me against each other. You're right-leaning, I'm left-leaning, and what they want to do is create this moment where you and I are fighting over this instead of fighting Russia. Russia has this as a strategy to demoralize us, and this is classic KGB techniques. I suggest- So battles back and forth between Americans so we don't, fight against well, Russia and not, the I'm not, I'm, I'm, the world. I have no interest in fighting Russia per se. I'm not interested in picking fights with foreign countries. Um, and oh, I'm also, you should want to fight against Russian interference. Yeah. I'm also not engaging in a fight with fellow Americans. I'm attempting to depropagandize fellow Americans who've been led to believe that Russian interference in the election was, I'm not saying it didn't happen. But they've, been led, yes, to, but they've been led to. We know But they've been led to believe that it was that it a much greater th threat sure. than it actually was. In order to empower centralized authorities to engage in censorship over a social network, so I'm trying to essentially um, deprogram 
an enormous yeah. amount of programming that's taken place. I do not consider that to be fighting with fellow Americans. Well, I mean, the point is you have the GOP recounting votes even to this day saying the election was stolen. And then you have on the left, you have the Democrats saying Russia won the election for Trump. In both cases, these are probably factually incorrect. In our last podcast, I cited the piece by Rich Lowry, sure. uh, which he is the editor of National Review, speaking to conservatives saying that this whole stolen election myth, yes, he called it a myth, is an albatross, is, it, is nothing, it will do nothing but backfire on conservatives and Republicans. I think there are plenty of people who recognize that story to be what it is. We're talking about something very 